Good afternoon. I welcome you all for today's discussion on real fluid flow and efficiency of turbo machines. In the last two lectures, when we talked about the principles of turbo machine, we talked about the velocity triangles, we talked about energy transfer, namely we have talked about Euler's energy equation and degree of reaction. While doing all these derivations, one thing we have kept in common. What is that? It is the concept of vane congruent flow or the flow does not vary inside the vane passage from passage to passage, from blade to blade, from shroud to shroud. However, in reality such a flow does not exist. Why? So, in the first part of today's lecture, we will explore the reasons. I will not go into the details of this real fluid flow. I will talk about what the different effects of real fluid flow that can be seen in the velocity triangles. And whenever we have a departure from an ideal flow, we will also get a less performance from the idealized condition and hence we will quantify this performance of a real turbo machine in terms of its efficiency. So, let us look at what is a real fluid flow and what are the causes. So, we are talking about an actual flow pattern and this actual flow pattern are caused by factors which make the vane congruent flow an unrealistic or not a practical one. So, if I look at it, we are talking about factors affecting specific work and factors affecting the flow angle, but not the specific work. Let us not worry about these terminologies. What is more important is what are the actual reasons behind these changes and we can say that we are talking about effect of the vane number. See one of the assumptions of vane congruent flow was that there are infinite number of vanes. So, we have to relax that assumption, we have to say in the real world infinite number of vanes are not possible, the vanes numbers are always finite and hence we can say that this vanes numbers of a talking about the effect of vane numbers, there are two effects we can see, one considering that the fluid is viscous and the second the fluid is not viscous or inviscid. So, this is the first effect of the finite number of vanes. What was the second assumption we had? The second assumption that we had was the vanes are of negligible thickness. We talked about in vane congruent flow infinite number of vanes with infinitesimally small thickness. So, in reality because of stress considerations or manufacturing difficulties, we cannot think of vanes which are having negligible or infinitesimally small thickness. So, we have to talk about the effect of finite vane thickness. We will start with that without relaxing the effect of viscosity that is we will first start with there is no viscous effect, just the number of vanes being made finite instead of the infinite vane assumption. So, let us look at it. We can talk about the pressure difference effect. When we talk about an finite number of blades, we will find that the pressure difference between the pressure side given by the plus sign in this drawing and the minus sign which is the suction side is going to increase. Smaller the number of blades, the higher will be this pressure difference which is often called the blade loading. And what happens whenever there is a pressure difference, the flow tries to establish from the high pressure side to the low pressure side. So, now let us look at a scenario when we are talking about the suction side as 1, pressure side as 2 as we have done and we can say that the fluid enters here in case of a pump or compressor from the suction side and ideal trajectory would have been the dashed arrow shown here, but because of the pressure difference there is a deviation, there is a departure and we see that the fluid flow actually leaves the pressure side at an angle which is different from the tangential direction. You may say that the pressure is different all throughout the blade length, it is true, but whenever we are doing this analysis, we are lumping the effect of the entire pressure difference on the final or the ultimate plane when the flow leaves the impeller. So, what we see? We see that 
the flow has an adverse pressure gradient and on top of it there you have the pressure which is acting in a way that there is a flow which deviates. In case of turbine when the flow comes from the top here also we will see there is a pressure difference, but in case of a turbine it is the velocity at the exit of the turbine impeller is much higher compared to the inlet. In case of pumps or compressors the velocity is low and you have a deviation. So, the resultant velocity that comes out at the pump impeller at 2 is actually going to have more deviation from the when congruent flow direction the tangential direction than in case of turbine. The second effect is called the relative circulation effect. So, let us look at what it means. You know that from the when congruent flow assumption that from blade to blade there is no difference in the velocity at any radial location. In the relative circulation it is said that the flow is apparently having a motion which is a pure circulation in which the arrows are shown here and you have a recirculation. How to visualize it? You can imagine that you have closed the ends and you are simply making the flow to rotate. So, now if you have the real flow the relative circulation effect shows you that because of the circulatory effect plus the when congruent flow there will be a difference in case of the flow inside the vent passage. This is again you have to remember there is no effect of viscosity. This effect the relative circulation effect can be thought of in a way in a similar way as we have talked about the pressure difference effect. Wherever there is a higher pressure we have shown there will be a flow leakage to the lower side and hence the velocity if you see the velocity is less here and the velocity is more here. Thus what we get? We get that along the the azimuthal direction at a given radius there is a difference between the velocities at different locations. So, we get a non-uniform velocity which is not considered in the when congruent flow. So, far we have not considered the viscous effect. Now, we if we consider the viscous effect we know that in case of pump or compressor there is an adverse pressure gradient and in fluid mechanics you have studied that that is a necessary condition for flow separation. It is not sufficient, but it is necessary. So, what we see is that in particularly in the off design conditions there are possibilities that a por large portion of the flow passage the vent passage you may have flow separations. And as a result there will be a very significant effect on the flow direction as shown here the dashed line arrow is actually corresponding to an idealized case and the solid arrow is an effect of the viscosity. In case of turbines what happens is the flow is from 2 to 1 and the flow is accelerating. If the flow is accelerating then there is a less chance of flow to separate because we have a favorable pressure gradient. So, it can only happen if there is a problem in the geometry or we are talking about a very much deviation from the design condition. Whatever be the case the effect of this flow separation even if it is present in a minor amount is not going to be significant in case of turbine. So, this is an axial flow scenario we could have made it the same for the radial flow scenario. The next effect is the vane thickness effect. When we talk about the vane thickness effect, let us look at the vanes more carefully. So, so far we have shown you only one line representing the vane, but here you see the vane has a finite thickness shown by the hatch lines. S1 is the spacing, we will talk about it, and this T is the thickness. So, if we zoom this portion of the blade we can show that the blade has a thickness T and of course, the T need not be uniform from the in, uh, inlet to the outlet from the suction side to the pressure side and the projection of T along the tangential direction is given in our consistent notation of T u. So, at the suction side we will say it is T u 1 at the pressure side we will say T u 2. Now, you imagine the first case when there is no blade thickness that means, we are considering only this line 
and the corresponding line here. The entire flow area was available for the fluid to flow. Now, when you have the veins of thickness T 1 at the in uh, at 1 and T 2 at 2, what happens is a portion of the area represented by this line T u 1, this is not available because this is occupied by the blades. So, what will happen? If the flow area changes, but your volume flow rate has not changed, then you have to accommodate it by change of velocity. So, let us look at what is the effect. If I say that the spacing is s, then I know that s is given by pi d by z. How do you get it? You say that the total circumference is pi d at any radius let us say d 1 or d 2 and there are z number of blades. So, the spacing between the blades is pi d by z and this T u is nothing but T by sin beta as I have shown in this small triangle here. So, now if we use it and apply continuity equation across the suction edge that is we consider the flow at 0 and 1, 1 being inside the blade passage which in which the blade angle is beta 1 b and 0 is just outside the impeller inlet edge in case of a pump or compressor. Then we can write that V dot is equal to S 1 multiplied by 1 is the depth and multiplied by C m 0 and inside the blade passage you have the blade thickness occupying a portion of the passage area and we write that S 1 minus T u 1 whole multiplied by C m 1. As a result it is very obvious that C m 1 is going to be more than C m 0 and this bracketed factor is called the blockage factor which is given by many times in the percentage. We can say that the blade thickness is such that it has 3 percent blockage. At the outside edge or the exit at 2 and 3 between 2 and 3 we can write that C m 2 equal to C m 3 is equal to multiplied by S 2 whole divided by S 2 minus T u 2 if we follow the same practice. 2 is inside the blade passage 3 is just what leaves and that gives me that C m 2 is greater than C m 3. So, fine we get the blade velocities are different, but how does it affect our velocity triangle? To know that we need to know what is the effect on the directions, what are the effects on the blade angles and the flow angles are they remaining same. To investigate it we look into the velocity triangles. We assume without any problem that like we have been doing consistently that the exit rail or the inlet rail in case of turbine and pump respectively that is C u 1 or C 1 u whatever notation you follow is equal to 0 that is C 1 is equal to C m and if we write it then we show that C m 0 is the velocity just outside the blade and C m 1 is the velocity just inside and we see that there is a change there is a change in the direction that is we are talking about this as the absolute velocity and we are talking about the relative velocity being changed from w 0 to w 1 and there is a change in the angle beta 1 from beta 1 b. So, we see that there is a deviation in the blade angle just like we have talked about the deviation in the blade angle because of finite number of blades. In the pressure side also we can similarly talk about that C 2 is more and C 3 is less and as a result beta 2 b is different from beta 2 once again. So, what do we learn? If we summarize whatever we have learned for the actual flow pattern so far, we understood that even in the absence of real fluid properties like viscosity, we can have deviations in from the blade angles in, uh, in case of the flows because of the number 1 the blade thickness and number 2 the number of blades or I should put it in the other way the number of blades and the blade thickness in the way of our discussion. So, these have to be kept in mind. So, another concept which comes to our mind and when we discuss turbo machines is the concept of slip. Even in an inviscid flow there is a difference in the actual flow 
and the vein congruent flow because of this factor called slip which arises in a case of finite number of blades. So, let us look at it. We have this dashed arrow which is an idealized condition of the velocities and the solid arrows which gives you the velocities which is reality that is C 2 prime is a real and uh, that is real in the sense it considers the slip, but it does not consider viscosity I must repeat and the dashed is C 2. So, what happens here is that I can say that this is the portion which contributes to the C 2 prime C 2 u prime and what we have here is the other one which talks about the C u 2 which is an idealized condition of vein congruent flow and as a result what we see is the difference between the two is given by delta C u 2 and hence we see that delta C u 2 is a slip which is the deviation of the actual flow with finite number of veins from the ideal flow with infinite number of veins and I repeat I stress that we are not considering any viscous effects. That is there is no real fluid effect, but there is an effect of finite number of veins. There are different slip factors or expressions possible. The one I am just showing for an example to bring out the effect of the number of blades is given by Stodola. So, is called Stodola's slip factor, which is given by the ratio of C u 2 prime by C u 2, where C u 2 corresponds to the vein congruent flow and C u 2 prime corresponds to the actual flow in case of finite number of veins. And this is the correlation given by Stodola, which is given by C u 2 minus u 2 pi sin beta 2 by z divided by C u 2 and it can be simplified further dividing throughout by C u 2, we get 1 minus u 2 by C u 2 pi sin beta 2 by z. Z is the number of blades as we have discussed and hence we get the relationship C u 2 from the velocity triangle is nothing but this is C u 2 which is nothing but u 2 minus C m 2 cot beta 2 and we get S is equal to 1 minus u 2 by u 2 minus C m 2 cot beta 2 multiplied by pi sin beta 2 by z. Thus, two conclusions can be drawn. The first one is as z tends to infinity this term drops off this entire term drops off and S tends to 1 which means C u 2 prime becomes C u 2. That was our starting point. If the turbo machine has infinite number of blades a very large number of blades then the guidance is proper there is no law deviation and we can say that the slip factor is 1 and C u 2 prime is equal to C u 2. The other is if the volume flow rate is more if volume flow rate increases then C m 2 increases and hence S reduces. So, you see that these are the two parameters which are going to determine how much is the slip. Of course, I have assumed that beta 2 does not change in this discussion. We will talk about the effect of beta 2 later on when we talk about the pumps in the next week. So, we have talked about the actual flows and the causes which make the flow to deviate from the vein congruent flow. Whenever we have a deviation from an idealized world, idealized conditions, we can expect that the, there will be a deterioration in the performance and this is given as losses in turbo machines. So, let us look at what are the different types of losses that we come across and how to account for it and finally, how this leads to efficiency. So, we can say that there are two types of losses, the internal losses or the losses taking place in the flow path and the external losses or the losses taking place outside the flow path. So, first we will talk about the internal losses. These are the hydraulic losses, leakage losses, disc friction losses and return flow losses. I will explain each one of these briefly soon. And the other one is external losses which is losses taking place outside the flow path. What is meant by outside the flow path? That means, the uh, losses which are as uh, in the locations which are not associated with the fluid flow. For example, losses due to friction in the bearings, ceilings etcetera, fluid friction at the shaft ends, power consumed by any auxiliary equipment which we may need all those. 
So, in this lecture today, we will touch upon this internal losses in some detail, the external losses all will be lumped as some loss term. So, let us look at hydraulic losses. The hydraulic losses arise because of frictional losses in the fluid channels, there can be skin friction pressure drop. The loss can be because of the separation of the flow on the veins or shroud surfaces, because we have talked about already the viscous effects. There could be sudden expansions and contractions because of some uh, geometrical constraints in the uh, design and all this gives rise to the hydraulic losses. But one thing we have to uh, keep in mind, let us say we are talking about a pump. This pump is connected between a sump and an overhead reservoir. Water flows from the sump to the overhead reservoir through the pump and pipes. When we talk about the losses, you may tend to think that I have to include the losses in the pipes also, but these hydraulic losses that we are discussing today in connection with turbo machines do not include the losses in the pipe. That is we are talking about the losses that take place inside the turbo machines that is between the inlet and delivery flanges of the turbo machine only. Please note that we will take care of the piping losses when we talk about the pumps later on. But for the losses in the hydraulic losses in turbo machines, we are talking about the inlet and delivery flanges and whatever is in between the losses that take place in this flow passage only. There is also another type of loss, hydraulic loss which can come up particularly at off design condition that is called the shock or incidence loss. I have already talked about this, there is a fact that when you are taking the fluid to approach at a proper angle which means the blade angle is equal to the flow angle it happens only at the design point at any off design condition and a turbo machine is expected to work over a range of uh, operate, uh, operating flow rate and not just at the design conditions and hence the shock or incidence loss has to be accounted for in such off design conditions. So, to understand the concept of incidence loss let us say that we have a guide vane and the flow leaves the tangentially to the guide vane. So, which flow leaves tangentially to the guide vane? it is the absolute velocity, because guide vanes are fixed they are not rotating. So, whatever leaves that fixed component tangentially must be the absolute velocity. And if the condition had been ideal, then the flow should have entered the impeller at tangentially at this point. However, we see that it does not happen in such a scenario. We find that this is the blade peripheral velocity which is fixed in this case we are considering and this is the absolute velocity of the fluid coming from the guide vanes tangential to the guide vane at the exit of the guide vane and this is the relative velocity which is now shown here. And if you can zoom this portion you can imagine that we are zooming this portion you will see that the blade is here and this, this orange arrow is tangential to these green uh, blades, but this line is not and hence there is a difference between the arrows shown here which is the real scenario and the arrow shown here which is the idealized case of the flow relative velocity entering the impeller tangentially. And this difference in the projection along the tangential direction is what is related with the shock or incidence loss. We will not go into that in this course, but it suffices if I say that the shock or incidence loss will be 0 at the design point and is non-zero at any other condition as shown here. We are talking about the different losses, we are talking about frictional losses, we know that from the pipe flow examples that you have done in fluid dynamics that the frictional loss is proportional to the volume flow rate square V dot square and it increases here it is from 0 at V dot equal to 0 in the fashion shown here and we are talking about the shock loss which is 0 at the design condition and non-zero and increases on either side of the design condition. So, when we talk about different hydraulic losses, we have to talk about the summation of the loss due to shock loss or incidence loss and the frictional losses. So, we will talk about both the losses together. Then we are talking about another important part we need to know is determination of volume flow rate because that is related with the power. So, we come back to the same old impeller we have been discussing so far or the schematic we have shown earlier and we can define the different dimensions d 1 at the smaller diameter 
D 2 at the pressure surface the corresponding blade heights are B 1 and B 2. So, that if I look at the radial flow machine and if I am talking about this blade passage then I can say that V dot 1 is nothing but pi D 1 B 1 multiplied by C 1 m and V dot 2 is nothing but pi D 2 B 2 multiplied by C 2 m. And hence for incompressible flow we know that V dot 1 equal to V dot 2 and we can relate D 1 B 1 C 1 m with D 2 B 2 C 2 m. For an axial flow machine it is slightly tricky. So, let us look at the axial flow machine and let us focus our attention on the rotor blades. And if I zoom it and put it separately we can say the portion of the rotor blade attached to the hub is having a diameter d h this is called the hub diameter and the portion which is far away at the open end which is called the tip of the blade is called the tip diameter d t and the flow takes place. And when we talk about it we are basically considering this as the blade height as the passage. So, we can consider the annulus area which is pi by 4 d t square minus d h square and we get that the corresponding volume flow rate is pi by 4 d t square minus d h square multiplied by c m. Another point you should note is this expression of c m in case of an axial flow machine is an axial flow direction. In case of a radial flow machine it is a radial flow direction because this will be visible only in the meridional view. So, these are the expressions that we need when we talk about the power in soon and you will also need these expressions to solve some of the problems given in the tutorial for this week and the next week. So, we are now talking about a turbo machine at the inlet and outlet again we are coming back to kind of a black box, but we know more about that what happens inside this black box called turbo machine. So, we say that pump and compressor would require more power to overcome losses that we have also obtained from thermodynamics if you recollect we said that in order to run a compressor we need a power which is must be greater than equal to some minimum power and we say that in case of even the blade specific work. So, blade specific work W B L is nothing but W which is the specific work or the useful energy difference per unit mass flow rate across the turbo machine plus delta W hydraulic. And here W B L is note that is a blade or impeller specific work and delta W hydraulic is a total hydraulic loss that we have discussed so far that is frictional losses because of fluid viscosity or viscous effects as well as the incidence loss. And the turbine we know from thermodynamics would produce less power due to the losses and here also we can say that W B L is equal to W minus delta W hydraulic. So, if we want to express in, an, in a single expression we can say that W B L is equal to W plus minus delta W hydraulic. This plus sign refers to the pump and the minus sign refers to the turbine. Next is the leakage loss. When we talk about leakage loss we are talking about the volume flow that is taking place through the leakage because of the pressure difference between the two ends of the turbo machine. Recollect what we have discussed in the very beginning of the turbo machine lectures when we said that reciprocating pump has physical barriers and hence that uh, does not suffer from leakage whereas, turbo machine pumps let us a centrifugal pump actually has a problem of leakage. So, we revisit this problem now. Let us say that we have an impeller and it has a casing. Now, a rotating component cannot be in contact with the stationary component. So, there must be some space some gap between the two and this is the schematic of the gap. Now, flow is taking place from the smaller diameter to the larger diameter and the flow that should come out and we have measured let us say we are doing experiments is V dot. Now, if you know that there is a pressure difference existing between the pressure surface side and the suction side and there is a leakage. So, what you can expect is a portion of the fluid will come back and rejoin the impeller. So, effectively the volume of fluid that is handled by the pump or compressor is not V dot, but V dot plus delta V dot because of the leakage flow. And in case of turbine it is reverse because in case of turbine the fluid is entering at a high pressure and leaving at a low pressure. So, now for the fluid there are two options one is to go through the blade passage and another one is to go through the gaps. So, V dot effective in this case of turbine is V dot minus delta V dot. 
Please note that the signs are becoming consistent for the pumps as positive and for turbine as negative. So, we have talked about the second. The third is the disc friction loss and this friction loss can be understood again in an analogical way. Let us say I give you an egg beater or a starter and I tell you I give you three fluids one is air, one is water, another one is glycerol. I ask you to rotate it, where do you find it is most difficult to rotate or start the fluid? Of course, it is glycerol, why? Because you have viscosity and if you have the same fluid, if you have to rotate it at a higher speed, you will have a more energy requirement from there, why? Because you have to overcome the losses. So, this friction loss takes place when the outside of the impeller is surrounded by fluid and due to rotation of the impeller, a resistive torque is set up leading to an increased power consumption in pumps. Let us look at this picture, this is the blade impeller and we have an axial flow machine, I have taken an axial flow machine as an example, this is the hub and the flow takes place, but this blade, this portion of the hub is actually in contact with the fluid and this entire hub is rotating which means that it will drag along with it because of fluid viscosity, the fluid around it and it will have a circulatory flow. So, what it means? It means that the there will be an energy drainage uh, which goes which is not productive which goes into just making this motion which is necessary and possible. So, what we get it is that our actual power output in case of turbine will be lowered further, in case of pumps or compressors this has to be overcome and hence the power requirement will increase. This disc friction loss depends on fluid properties like viscosity and density and geometry and the speed of rotation. For example, if I take Pelton turbine which rotates in air or the fan in the ceiling fan in your home which rotates in air, this effect can be neglected, but if it is in water or any other fluid this effect can be significant. So, the last of the losses in the internal flows is the return flow loss. Return flow loss is more com uh, commonly seen in pumps and compressors and in the off design condition. How do you understand it return flow loss? Let us say that we have a pump which is either radial or axial and the flow takes place from a low pressure side to the high pressure side, you have to overcome the adverse pressure gradient. And now at off design conditions particularly at a discharge much lower than the design conditions, the fluid will not have enough energy to overcome it. So, you will the find that the flow recirculates and goes back. So, what it means? It has entered the blade passage as you can see in the two cases and then flows out. So, the blade has done some work on this flow which does not produce productively, but please remember this happens at a condition which is far away from the design condition at a very much lower flow rate. So, when we are talking about estimation of power, we can say that the ideal power is P ideal, in this case there are no losses and hence the blade specific work will be the same as the specific work across the turbine turbo machine and we get that P ideal is rho V dot W, but the actual internal power will be P internal is rho V dot plus minus delta V dot, please note that plus minus with the proper sign conventions for pump is positive and for turbine it is negative multiplied by W B L. If you have to also relate W B L with W B L infinity with the help of slip term plus minus P D F plus minus P R F. Please note that this P D F which has a plus minus sign and the P R F the return flow loss which has a plus minus sign, the plus refers to the pump and minus refers to the turbine. We can say that equivalent internal specific work W internal will be 1 plus minus delta V dot by V dot W B L plus minus Z D F that is just we have divided P D F by rho V dot plus minus Z R F. The sign convention remains the same and we can talk about estimation of power. We say that W B L is W plus delta W hydraulic and W internal is 1 plus V dot by V dot W B L plus Z D F plus Z R F whatever we have done I am just now separating out for pumps and compressors hopefully that will also help you in keeping in mind that W internal is greater than W B L is greater than W. Okay? You see here that W internal is greater than W B L and W B L is greater than W. In case of turbine it is reverse and we see that 
W internal is less than W B L is less than W. That means, a portion of the energy in case of turbine is drained to overcome the losses. In case of pumps and compressors, it has to be supplied with more energy. And then we can talk about the external losses like the mechanical losses without going into details of different uh, types of mechanical losses, we, we can simply say that P coupling is equal to P internal plus minus P mechanical. This plus sign again comes for pumps and minus sign comes for the turbine. What it means that the coupling power that has to be provided by the motor in case of pump should be more than the internal power because some portion of the power however less may be will be used to overcome the losses in the mechanical. Then we can talk about the corresponding efficiencies as the ratio of the power output to the power input and we can say that efficiency of any real machine cannot be 100 percent which means this is because of the losses in turbo machines losses occur at different stages and through different ways. So, we need to define various efficiencies to account for these losses and we can say the hydraulic efficiency as eta h is equal to w by w b l to the power plus minus 1. In practice hydraulic efficiency is difficult to measure or estimate as this friction and return flow losses are difficult to separate and hence many times what is done is we talk about internal efficiency as rho v dot w by p internal to the uh, plus minus 1. I will talk about what sign you are talking about. It is essentially the plus and minus for pumps and turbines and we can say mechanical efficiency is p internal by p c. Already you know that in case of pumps or compressors the coupling power from the motor should be more and hence you know the sign convention as I have talked about on other cases also and you get P internal by P C. And overall efficiency is the net change in the useful energy across the turbo machine and the coupling power the ratio of the 2 to the power plus minus 1. In case of pump the coupling power has to be more and you know which is the plus sign. In case of turbine the actually the fluid has more power and then this will be reversed we will get a minus sign here. So, in case of turbine you will write P c by rho v dot w, in case of pump you will write it as uh, rho v dot w by P c. And you can show that overall efficiency is nothing but the product of the internal efficiency and the mechanical efficiency. To bring out this flow pitches common in a graphical way or with the help of cartoon, let us look at this. This is a motor which is connected to the pump and there is a coupling power which is provided by the motor to the pump and this is my symbol of a coupling between the two uh, shafts and there is a mechanical loss. So, what happens? The mechanical loss has to be subtracted from the coupling power and what goes into the pump is an internal power P int and now there are return flow or disc friction losses which take away some portion of the energy and hence the energy that is available to the fluid to flow is less. We say that P c is P internal plus P mechanical and we say that a less amount of energy goes after overcoming the return flow and the disc friction losses. And then we have the slip, the hydraulic losses and the leakage losses that take away some portion of the energy and we get the P internal expressed already we have done rho v dot plus delta v dot multiplied by w b l. If you have w b l infinity from the idealized condition, you can use slip to get w b l plus p d f plus p r f and what happens to the fluid. So, there is an inlet, a fluid comes in and the pump supplies some energy to the fluid and as a result at the outlet, you see this arrow has become bigger this is a symbolic way of saying that energy is added to the fluid. However, you also should keep in mind that in case of pump uh, the motor gives an energy which is P c which is much more compared to what is actually delivered to the fluid and hence you can define efficiency accordingly. In case of turbine we have the turbine and the flow takes place in, in the inlet and the fluid energy is taken by the turbine. 
it has to overcome the slip, the hydraulic losses and the leakage loss. Then it has to overcome the return flow and the disk friction losses and we get the internal power what comes out after subtraction of the uh, mechanical losses we get the coupling power in the generator and hence this is the output what we get. But if you see that the fluid has actually given much more energy and what goes out in the form of coupling power is much less because it has to overcome the losses and we are talking about this as a turbine. So, the outlet what happens? Outlet if you see has less energy compared to this inlet because the fluid has been taken away some energy by the machine and hence the outlet energy available in the fluid has been schematically shown by a thinner arrow. So, this is a turbine and we have the generator. I thought this is useful, but if this appears a little complicated, you can think about a simple energy budgeting like this. This is the input, input means which comes from the motor, a portion of the energy is drained away by the mechanical losses, what comes in is a W internal and then you have to overcome the leakage loss, disk friction and return flow loss, you get WBL and ultimately you have to overcome hydraulic losses. So, what is added to the fluid is W which you measure across the pump. In case of turbine it is a reverse scenario, this is what is available with the fluid which you have measured across the turbine, you assume that all will go into useful work, but it does not because a portion goes for hydraulic loss. Then we have the blade and then we can say that a portion of the energy that is available in WBL also has to go because of leakage loss, the disk friction loss and the return flow loss. What comes out of the turbine is even getting reduced by the mechanical losses, what goes comes out of generator will be less because of the generator efficiency, but we are not considering it here. So, what goes from the turbine to the generator is less than what was available with the fluid. So, to summarize we have talked about the reasons behind the deviation of flow from when congruent flow, we have talked about the real flow with real fluid properties leads to losses and different losses are discussed and we have talked about the efficiencies which are related with these losses and the relation between the different efficiencies. In the next lecture, we will take up some problems which are based on this week's discussion. We will do the step by step calculations and also we will find the tutorials which will help you to connect these efficiencies and the losses and the performance of these turbo machines. In the coming week, we will talk about in more detail some of these aspects of efficiencies etcetera in connection with pumps and hydraulic turbines. Thank you.